Chapter 3. Consciousness, Experience and Nerve Process Difference of Experience and Consciousness From what has been discussed in the first chapter, it follows with regard to life. It is not found in the world of things and is incompatible with force and cause. But how do we then come to the assumption of its existence? Because we experience it ourselves. The bearer of life is the bearer of experience, and the question about the essence of life coincides with the question about the essence of experience. According to linguistic evidence, consciousness means, as has already been noted, to take cognizance of something, to know about something. Now one takes knowledge of something by the act of perception, and the original act of perception is the act of perception. But the act of perception can neither coincide with the perceived, nor be a kind of reflection of it, assumption of the Greeks. It does not coincide with the perceived. For if I see a red thing, I do not produce a red act of perception. If I hear a sound, I do not produce a resounding act of perception. If I smell a fragrance, I do not produce a fragrant act of perception, etc. It is also not a mirror image of the perceived, for all sensual species properties. Uh, it is also not a mirror image of the perceived, for all sensual species properties are incomparably different from each other which is why one does not give a deaf-born person the slightest idea of sounds and tones by describing them. If now the act of perceiving, and the kind of a reflection, would correspond to the perceived species' properties, then all acts of perception would have to be incomparably different from each other. Consequently, however, we could have no concept of perceiving, and consequently also no concept of consciousness. If our perception of the world would be a representation of the world, then we would not know at all that we would have consciousness. From this we draw the following conclusion. If every act of cognition is necessarily different from every other act of cognition numerically, but not species-wise, then the sensual species properties of which we take cognizance must have been experienced by us. However, the experience relates to the experienced, so much as certain, that it is completely different from the act of taking cognizance. Difference between experience and bodily process According to today's view, experiences offer two different sides, one of which is called sensations, and the other one feelings. For the time being we stick to sensation, but assign it the name sensory experience. The occurrence of sense experiences is bound to certain processes of the body, namely to the peripheral sense organs, the sensory nerves and the sensory centres, and the natural scientist now tends to equate those, the sense experiences, with the body processes. He thus resolves sense experiences into molecular movements of sensory nerves, now this is wrong for two reasons. A. If the sensory experience of the colour red, for example, coincided with molecular movements in the optic nerve, we would perceive the redness in our head, but not outside our head. B. Then also, the person A would have to perceive the red experience of the person B, provided only that the processes in the optic nerve would be illuminated sufficiently. But even if we would see all molecular movements in the sensorium of a person sensing red, we would see only molecular movements, and not the slightest of the experienced redness. One can see colours, but not see the seeing, hear sounds, but not hear the hearing, and so on. Consequently, sensory experiences are not objective bodily processes. But then, no experience is an objective bodily process. We find experiences just as little in the world of things as we found life in it. Since they are not acts of perception either, experiences must not be confused with existing things, 
nor with the acts of consciousness referring to them. To these deconstructive propositions about the nature of experience, we immediately add two constructive ones. Artificiality of the experience. All experiences are different from each other. If it is necessary, the experience, with the help of which we grasp an unlimited number of species' properties, then the mediating experiences themselves must be different from each other. Whoever has any doubts about this should only check the counter-assumption. If the process of seeing were to coincide with the process of hearing, it would be inconceivable how colours could be offered to us through the former and sounds through the latter. If the red experience were to coincide with the blue experience, then unquestionably red would also coincide with blue for us. There are so many species differences of the sense data, so many species differences of the sensual experience. We have to recognise this, even though it may be difficult for us to decide how the experience is to be derived from the experienced. Spatio-temporality of experience no sound can be thought as real, which does not pass through a space, and sound a time span, however short it may be. No colour, which does not cover a surface, even if it is small like a point, and which does not exist in a time span, different from zero. If we take away the space and the time, then we have already taken away colours, sound, smells, taste, temperature, hard, rough, wet, sweet, and so on. All sensual qualities, species, meet us at something spatio-temporal. If the experience conveys qualities to us, then it must also have conveyed their spatio-temporality to us. And if it can communicate them to us only because it has itself been artificially tuned by them, then this only through its own participation in the spatial and temporal outside of each other. The slightest reflection teaches us further that neither the space nor the time consists of a sum of indivisible units. We can divide no time distance in such a way that each part would not be again be would not be again an arbitrarily divisible time distance. No volume that each partial volume could not be divided again into the unlimited. The vanishing small space is of one and the same nature with the unlimited large space. The vanishing short time of one in the same nature with the unlimited long time. Within the respective limits set by us, both have the characteristic of boundless continuity. Consequently also, the space-time receptivity of our experience must have the characteristic of boundless continuity. Space-time, continuity and kindness are extra-spiritual, and therefore incomprehensible. Refutation of panlogism. Against this, panlogism exists. It makes no sense to speak of something extrinsic, because already our speaking reveals that we have a concept of the communicated. But since concepts are products of the spirit, we never have to do with something else than with products of the spirit. The first is to say that it is one thing to mean something judgingly, and another to penetrate it mentally. The concept of redness is indeed a mental product, but it means a reality that is neither produced by the spirit, nor ever penetrated by it mentally. If it were otherwise, the judgment, this is red, would have to awaken even in the blind board the born the contemplation of the visual content of the red. If it does this only for the sighted person, then the cause of this lies clearly in the fact that it only reminds him of something he has experienced from which it follows inevitably that the experiential content of the red cannot come from the spirit. But is not the experiential content of the redness so also not that of another quality, just as not its spatio-temporality, just as not the continuity of the spatio-temporal? As certainly as the concepts are products of the mind, just as certainly only the one ability is inherent in them, to refer to the contents of experience, which are therefore presupposed and cannot be comprehended on their part. Quote unquote, 
concept is indeed a, by the way, learned derivation of quote-unquote comprehend. Therefore, however, I comprehend it does not at all mean the same as I have a concept of it, but it means I understand it, have penetrated it mentally, have taken possession of it. We also have a concept of the incomprehensible, but no one will assert that the incomprehensible is therefore comprehended. If we now argue for the incomprehensibility of all sensuous species, their spatio-temporality and the continuity of the spatio-temporal, then the question arises as to what in the world can be fundamentally comprehended and thus completely penetrated by the spirit. But this question can also be posed as follows. What, in the precipitations of the thinking activity, testifies only to the spirit, without the addition of a material of experience? The answer is, directly, only the thought of the unity of what is meant by each concept, in view of the circumstance, however, than in relation to the world of events. The setting of one repeats itself without restriction and unites the repeated in series again in the thought of multiplicity, indirectly, also the concept of number. Numbers are what they are, independent of the personal experience, can be mentally generated into the unlimited, and do not participate in the least in the fluctuations to which the indicating function of the concepts is more or less always subject according to the individual differences of the changing bearers of consciousness. If I speak to someone of five trees, I will certainly be allowed to believe that he associates the same concept with tree in order to distinguish what is meant from grasses, animals, rocks, but I will not be able to achieve this by adding any number of epithets. Congruence of the sensual schemes of his and my concept of tree, as is most clearly evident in such structures, towards which the judgments diverge as to whether they still belong to the trees or not. Whereas their fifthness obviously remains completely unaffected by whether one means the trees to be large or small, close together or far apart, leafy or bare or needled, and absolutely unthinkable would be there, swinging over to the side of the fourthness or the sixthness. In other words, with the arithmetic number words, the concept coincides with the meaning. Therefore, they are to be replaced unambiguously by formulaic signs of inevitable usability, calculating machine, with which the life-centered nature of the number also expressively manifests itself. According to this now, the outer as well as inner world can be penetrated mentally, as far as it offers a countable side, from which the scientific wishful thinking of exactness explains itself. In addition, we note, no quality, colour, sound, smell, etc., differs numerically from another, none numerically from space and time, the space not numerically from the time, Finally, the vividly continuous, not numerically from the discontinuous, because only discontinuous can be counted.